Section 2.5.2, the SHA-3 hash function. As I mentioned earlier, both the MD5 and SHA-1 hash functions were broken somewhat recently. These two functions made use of the same merkle damgard construction I described in the previous section. Because of this, and the fact that SHA-2 is vulnerable to length extension attacks, NIST decided in 2007 to organize an open competition for a new standard, SHA-3. This section introduces the newer standard and attempts to give a higher level explanation of its inner workings. In 2007, 64 different candidates from different international research teams entered the SHA-3 contest. Five years later, Ketchak, one of the submissions, was nominated as the winner and took the name SHA-3. In 2015, SHA-3 was standardized in the FIPS publication 202. See this link. SHA-3 observes the three previous security properties we talked about and provides as much security as the SHA-2 variants. In addition, it is not vulnerable to length extension attacks and can be used to hash secrets. For this reason, it is now the recommended hash function to use. It offers the same variants as SHA-2, this time indicating the full name SHA-3 in their named variants. SHA-3-224, SHA-3-256, SHA-3-384, and SHA-3-512. Thus, similarly to SHA-2, SHA-3-256 provides 256 bits of output, for example. Let me now take a few pages to explain how SHA-3 works. SHA-3 is a cryptographic algorithm built on top of a permutation. The easiest way to understand a permutation is to imagine the following. You have a set of elements on the left and the same set of elements on the right. Now trace arrows going from each element on the left to the right. Each element can only have one arrow starting from and terminating to it. You now have one permutation. Figure 2.11 illustrates this principle. By definition, any permutation is also reversible, meaning that from the output we can find the input. SHA-3 is built with a sponge construction, a different construction from merkle damgard that was invented as part of the SHA-3 competition. It is based on a particular permutation called Ketchak F that takes an input and returns an output of the same size. Note, we won't explain how Ketchap F was designed, but you will get an idea in Chapter 4 about this because it substantially resembles the AES algorithm, with the exception that it doesn't have a key. This is no accident, as one of the inventors of AES was also one of the inventors of SHA-3. In the next few pages, I use an 8-bit permutation to illustrate how the sponge construction works. Because the permutation is set in stone, you can imagine that figure 2.12 is a good illustration of the mapping created by this permutation on all possible 8-bit inputs. Compared to our previous explanation of a permutation, you can also imagine that each possible 8-bit string is what we represented as shapes. 0, 0, 0 is a triangle, 100 is a square, and so on. To use a permutation in our sponge construction, we also need to define an arbitrary division of the input and the output into a rate and a capacity. It's a bit weird, but stick with it. Figure 2.13 illustrates this process. Where we set the limit between the rate and the capacity is arbitrary. Different versions of SHA-3 use different parameters. We informally point out that the capacity is to be treated like a secret and the larger it is, the more secure the sponge construction. Now, like all good hash functions, we need to be able to hash something, right? Otherwise, it's a bit useless. To do that, we simply XOR the input with the rate of the permutation's input. In the beginning, this is just a bunch of zeros. As we pointed out earlier, the capacity is treated like a secret, so we won't XOR anything with it. Figure 2.14 illustrates this. The output obtained should now look random, although we can trivially find what the input is as a permutation is reversible by definition. What if we want to ingest a larger input? Well, similarly to what we did with SHA-2, we would 1. Pad the input if necessary, 
Then divide the input into blocks of the rate size. 2. Iteratively call the permutation while XORing each block with the input of a permutation and permuting the state, the intermediate value output by the last operation, after each block has been XORed. I ignore the padding in the rest of these explanations for the sake of simplification, but padding is an important step of the process to distinguish between inputs like 0 and 00, zero for example. Figure 2.15 pictures these two steps. So far, so good, but we still haven't produced a digest. To do this, we can simply use the rate of the last state of the sponge. Again, we are not touching the capacity. To obtain a longer digest, we can continue to permute and read from the rate part of the state as figure 2.16 shows. And this is how SHA-3 works. Because it is a sponge construction, ingesting the input is naturally called absorbing, and creating the digest is called squeezing. The sponge is specified with a 1,600-bit permutation using different values for R and C, depending on the security advertised by the different versions of SHA-3. SHA-3 is a random oracle. I talked about random oracles earlier, an ideal and fictional construction that returns perfectly random responses to queries and repeats itself if we query it with the same input twice. It turns out that the sponge construction behaves closely to a random oracle, as long as the permutation used by the construction looks random enough. How do we prove such security properties on the permutation? Our best approach is to try and break it, many times until we gain strong confidence in its design, which is what happened during the SHA-3 competition. The fact that SHA-3 can be modeled as a random oracle instantly gives it the security properties we would expect from a hash function. Section 2.5.3 Shake and C-Shake two extendable output functions, or ZOTH. I introduced the two major hash function standards, SHA-2 and SHA-3. These are well-defined hash functions that take arbitrary length inputs and produce random-looking and fixed-length outputs. As you will see in later chapters, cryptographic protocols often necessitate this type of primitives but do not want to be constrained by the fixed sizes of a hash function's digest. For this reason, the SHA-3 standard introduced a more versatile primitive called an extendable output function, or XOF, pronounced ZOF. This section introduces the two standardized ZOFs, SHAKE and C-SHAKE. SHAKE, specified in FIPS 202 along with SHA-3, can be seen as a hash function that returns an output of an arbitrary length. SHAKE is fundamentally the same construction as SHA-3 except that it is faster and permutes as much as you want it to permute in the squeezing phase. Producing outputs of different sizes is quite useful not only to create a digest, but also to create random numbers, to derive keys, and so on. I will talk about the different applications of Shake again in this book. For now, imagine that Shake is like SHA-3, except that it provides an output of any length you might want. This construction is so useful in cryptography that one year after SHA-3 was standardized, NIST published its special publication 800-185, containing a customizable shake called C-Shake. C-Shake is pretty much exactly like Shake, except that it also takes a customization string. This customization string can be empty, or it can be any string you want. Let's first see an example of using C-Shake in pseudocode. As you can see, the two digests differ even though C-Shake is as deterministic as Shake and SHA-3. This is because a different customization string was used. A customization string allows you to customize your Zoft. This is useful in some protocols where, for example, different hash functions must be used in order to make a proof work. We call this domain separation. As a golden rule in cryptography, if the same cryptographic primitive is used in different use cases, do not use it with the same key, if it takes a key, or and apply domain separation. You will see more examples of domain separation as we survey cryptographic protocols in later chapters. Warning. 
NIST tends to specify algorithms that take parameters in bits instead of bytes. In the example, a length of 256 bits was requested. Imagine if you had requested a length of 16 bytes and got 2 bytes instead. Due to the program thinking, you had requested 16 bits of output. This issue is sometimes called a bit attack. As with everything in cryptography, the length of cryptographic strings like keys, parameters, and outputs is strongly tied to the security of the system. It is important that one does not request too short outputs from Shake or C-Shake. One can never go wrong by using an output of 256 bits, as it provides 128 bits of security against collision attacks. But real-world cryptography sometimes operates in constrained environments that could use shorter cryptographic values. This can be done if the security of the system is carefully analyzed. For example, if collision resistance does not matter in the protocol making use of the value, pre-image resistance only needs 128-bit long outputs from Shake or C-Shake.